In the final part of this lecture, we'll cover another related aspect of economic stability. Here, the design of what we call algorithmic primary markets, which is coming from our upcoming work on the new gyroscope mechanism. First, let's discuss how algorithmic stablecoins work and often break by relating to how traditional currency pegs work. In a traditional currency peg model, there are two sources of value in the system. One coming from asset backing, which is a tangible source of value, and another from economic usage, which is really intangible and a bit hard to measure. And the idea here with economic usage is that uh, if this currency unlocks access to a strong economy, then there are extra reasons and value to be drawn on to help actually back the peg. And if in combination these two values are high enough compared to the target, then the $1 peg can be sustained in equilibrium. But if one of these sources of value takes a hit, for instance, if uh, the assets become worth, worth less, then the peg can break in what's known as a speculative attack. And it's worth noting this is a very simplified description of how this works, and uh, you can see a much more precise model in Morris and Shin's paper. So how does this help us understand the recent collapse of many algorithmic stablecoins? Well, these systems try to start with under 100% asset backing, but at the same time, they start with no native usage, which means that the value from uh, economic usage is very low here. And as a result, the peg often breaks in speculative attacks. There are also some further complications about what the asset backing looks like in these systems. In uh, senior shares, for instance, the asset backing is really the value of endogenous equity shares, which have largely, uh, uh, they, they largely have self-referential price that, that can evaporate in a crisis. In the basis designs, there's, there's really nothing here, no asset backing. And in reserve-backed systems, this is some portfolio of other assets. Now, it's worth noting that this differs from traditional currency pegs, where the actual pegged currency can be held in reserve, but uh, US dollars, for instance, are inherently not an on-chain asset, and so this is not possible in these systems. There is a further important dimension to, to understanding algorithmic stablecoins. So consider that if, uh, if the system is actually working, there, that a new user who is entering the system uh, pays a, do a dollar's worth of assets for any new stablecoin that's created. And an important question here is, where does that dollar go? So there's a range of possibilities, actually, uh, from going into the pockets of stakeholders to going to some sort of a reserve fund. And the important consequence is what happens in a crisis in these different uh, settings. When the assets go to stakeholders, uh, like through buybacks or dividends to these stakeholders, uh, these assets that are coming into the system through minting, uh, through minting new stable coins, they're removed from the system actually and not available later to support stability. And instead, we're sort of relying on speculators to, to bet uh, on future demand growth um, in these sort of crisis situations. And often this results in them actually abandoning the system uh, when these bets become uncredible. When assets partly go to stakeholders and partly to a reserve, then the reserve is necessarily small and less stabilizing than it could have been. And in this setting, the system may, may, may be prone to, uh, to bank run-like effects and Soros-style speculative attacks as well. Uh, verse, when all assets are attained by the system in a reserve, then the system is necessarily stronger compared to these other cases and more stabilizing because there's more value retained to handle a crisis. And the market has, uh, has basically worked out like this, with all the basis clones breaking and many of the hybrid senior share systems also breaking, uh, including the, uh, uh, it's worth including sort of the, the other main dimensions here as well. Uh, uh, one of them is that the, uh, the composition of assets in the reserve is quite an important consideration here. Uh, for instance, taking into account the, the different risks faced by these assets. And also uh, the, the aspects of how the system maintains stability uh, in terms of how it actually like forms a stablecoin market. This leads us to our work on algorithmic primary markets. So here, a primary market means uh, the venue for minting and redeeming of stablecoins. Uh, and this is related to open market operations in, in traditional money. And we establish a redemption curve 
to be the price of redemption of a, of a stable coin as a function of the system state. So a key factor here is what do these redemption curves actually look like? Well, we visualize them by plotting uh, price versus the level of redemption activity that, that's accommodated at that price. And they range from providing all liquidity uh, that's available at $1 uh, pricing, uh, backed by whatever assets are actually held in the reserve, to redemption curves that, uh, that may have higher curvature and thus decreasing redemption rates. How our previous discussion of currency pegs fits in here is that if we establish all liquidity at a dollar uh, on this redemption curve, then this is really only possible until liquidity is exhausted, uh, until the reserve itself is exhausted, at which point uh, there may be no assets left to maintain the prices. And importantly, this can be triggered by a speculative attack if it's profitable uh, to do so. There's a lot to draw on in traditional finance uh, about these sort of speculative attacks, actually. Uh, the most famous example is Soros's attack on the British pound, uh, which maintained a relatively stable peg, actually, the British pound against the, uh, the Deutsche Mark until what's known as Black, Black Wednesday, when, when the, the British pound was forced off the peg uh, by a speculative attack to a large profit for, for Soros's fund. And in this case, the Bank of England decided at, uh, at some point that the speculative attack was unwinnable and took the hit to abandon the peg without exhausting uh, their assets further. Let's now walk through a few case studies of how primary market structure has worked out in, in various stable coins. So these are usually ad hoc and uh, mostly even implicit, these, these structures, and not direct, directly recognized in most designs. So first up are the, uh, the basis type designs. And here, the implicit uh, redemption curve is that stable coins can be redeemed, or, or what they call locked, for endogenous coupons. Uh, and these coupons, a speculator would have to hope to be, that these would become profitable in future supply expansions. However, when the coupon demand disappears, uh, the implied redemption curve itself becomes flat at zero, and uh, this is because there's really no asset back. And this is effectively what we witnessed then in the collapse of, uh, of these types of systems. Next up is uh, USDC and USDT. So these have uh, flat redemption curves at uh, $1, but they occur off-chain, and so we must really trust the, uh, the issuers in these cases to maintain these, these primary markets and access to these primary markets. And it's worth noting that the DAI PSM, which we talked about before, is essentially a wrapped version of this, inheriting USDC's primary market by extension. Next, consider FEI. FEI's initial mechanisms included something called direct incentives, which made the implied redemption curve uh, very steep to zero dollars, as you can see here on the, uh, the green curve. When the system launched, it was actually in an unexpectedly healthy state, uh, even though it was intended to start under collateralized, it held ETH as a reserve asset, and an increase in the ETH price meant that the system actually started over collateralized. However, it started with an oversupply of stable coins and the system saw a very large demand to redeem, but the implicit redemption curve was quickly exhausted and this left the uh, stable coin with effectively no support and high resulting volatility. And the reason here is that the only remaining venue for liquidity is then secondary markets, not these primary markets. Uh, and these secondary markets are left to price uh, the stablecoin within the primary market bounds, but these, uh, these bounds were effectively all the way from $0 to, to $1. Later, direct incentives were removed and the implied redemption curve shifted to look like a, a constant product Uniswap pool, uh, which shown as this, uh, this purple curve here. Uh, which is still a rather ad hoc choice uh, for a primary market design as the liquidity is still uh, rather poor in that setting. We lastly consider senior share stablecoins. So these are redeemable for a dollar's worth of assets, but they're really mostly backed by a volatile endogenous asset. That is one that has this sort of self-referential price. And speculative attacks can cause the collapse of this, uh, this asset value as we've seen in both Terra and Iron, or also known as Titan, uh, fatally for, uh, for, for the Iron system. 
So this is the same premise as before. Uh, the protocol can provide liquidity at a dollar uh, until it's exhausted, at, at which point the peg must break and the system may be in a death spiral. And this is what happened in the iron stablecoin system, uh, illustrating this sort of a speculative attack. So Titan was the endogenous underlying asset whose value went to zero. Um, and this happened as a large, uh, uh, large redemptions occurred in iron, the, the stable coin. Uh, and since iron is redeemed for a dollar's worth of newly minted Titan, this ended up uh, causing the inflation of Titan uh, to, to having a zero dollar value. And this motivates our work uh, on designing uh, autonomous primary markets. Uh, the current space of primary market mechanisms, as we've kind of seen at this point, is uh, fairly ad hoc and often relies on governance processes uh, to make quick fixes in crises. So this means like changing parameters in a crisis to change the implicit primary market curve shape. And kind of missing here uh, currently is how to design primary markets with desired properties, uh, sort of from the ground up, from first principles, that can adapt autonomously. And this is what we've been doing in our gyroscope uh, PAMM paper. So here's a quick overview uh, of how this all works. When the system is 100% reserved, the idea is that the redemption curve should be a flat line close to a dollar because that's the sustainable level of redemptions in this type of a system. Uh, here, viewing it compared to a, a constant product Uniswap pool. And now if the system is under-reserved, however, here considering uh, an 80% reserve ratio, say, then the idea is that the redemption curve should provide some level of liquidity near the dollar peg, but subject to a circuit breaker uh, that brings redemptions in line with a new sustainable level so that the system can't be exhausted itself. And as the reserve ratio increases, this redemption rate should shift back toward the straight line redemption curve, um, providing uh, close to perfect liquidity around a dollar. And so in our work, we formalize this as a new PAMM or primary market automated market maker design that has several provable properties that make it uh, desirable from the standpoint of a, uh, of a good stablecoin primary market. So this includes uh, bounded loss for the protocol and redeemers. In particular, uh, the idea here is that reserve assets can't be depleted in the system and redeemers also get a fair price. Uh, we also show properties of path deficiency, which is a concept in, in AMM designs uh, that effectively establishes that there's no incentive to subdivide trades. And in particular, this makes it simple for traders to work uh, with this curve strategically. And it can also be constructed, uh, as we show, in a way that is efficiently computable uh, on-chain in the highly strict and expensive uh, computational environment. One further nice property is that the, uh, the shape can help to actually deter the sort of speculative attack problems we were seeing earlier by removing their profitability or lowering their profitability. And the idea here is that the shape, uh, the, the shape of the curve uh, partly adapts to, to account for this, in fact. 